I'm going to start the recording, which I just started. Hello, recording. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to I'm going to put this onto Facebook onto Radio Free Nakla Oats Facebook page. So bear with me, people who are seeing this recording later. If there are people seeing this recording later, come on, Radio Free. Is that what you do? People record these things and then, then they put them on Facebook? Well, I'm putting it on Facebook Live right now. That's oh, what I'm working on right now. Um, so okay. it's going to be on, on Radio Free Nakla Oaks page. Uh, and we can share it from there. But um, I want to just say, okay. Well, now I'm typing in Hebrew. Okay, that's not good. Change to English. <laughs> Family album. She's what? I'm just going to show you what to do real quick while she's figuring her thing out. Okay. Okay. So she's trying to show me something while you're figuring your thing out. So I'm going to go through it one more time with you. When she needs to share the screen, just go down here, hit screen share. Uh huh. And then right here, you can see already up right there. Uh huh. You click that right there, and then it will bring it up. And then just hit cancel. And you're where you need to be. And okay. then the Egypt pages are right there. And it's the same thing? Yeah, and you go over here and we're over to Egypt. Well, I can holler for you. You'll just be in the next Yeah, room. I'm just going to be just next room. Just so it's not just like a masked person that will come in. No worries. I was, well, that's okay. It will just show you how much my caregiver cares for me. <laughs> yeah, she wears so much. So I stop share. We well, stop that's because share. she leaves our bubble, you know, and she goes into the outside world and then she comes back. Totally. She goes over to Emeryville to her bubble. Yeah. From in bubble to bubble. In a bu bubble that they're referring to as the people that live in your household with you that you see all the time. Right. We all live in little bubbles. Of so people true. That with. You know, like I live in a four person bubble that sometimes has five people in it because she's the girlfriend of the guy who owns the house and she's a nurse at oh. the UCSF. So we all really want, and I'm, I'm like highly susceptible to death from this disease, so, you know. Well, we don't I, want that. We don't want walk, anything. We walk on eggshells around here. I mean, we all, we, everybody's really careful. We don't want to get anybody sick in this bubble. Right, no, no. Yeah. We want everyone to live and be well. That is the whole right. idea. Okay. Yeah. We're almost, we're, we're pretty yeah. much almost live. Hold on. I mean, we definitely are live, but now we're just doing the technicalities. Okay. Nice. Right, I'm going to go. Um, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, here's Laura's going to go clean my room. And if I need help, all of a sudden, I have to yep, do So all call. you do is remember, hit screen share. It'll pop up. You just hit cancel. And then you'll have the, the Where's page. my thing? Oh, it'll pop right. up. It'll pop up. When you hit screen share, it'll pop up. And you'll see this. Okay. All, all right. right. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Yes. Light up, people. It's time. We're here. We're live. It's 4.02, but soon it's going to be 4.20, California time. I am live on Radio Free Nakla Oats, 11th annual Nine Days of Jerry, with the one, the only, the legendary, Gerilyn Brandelis, the author of the Grateful Dead family album, founder of The Wheel, an online community for Grateful Dead and Deadhead loving people, and one of the legendary women of the Grateful Dead. And as we all know from our own personal life experience and from the dead culture, many people say that the dead culture is a very male dominated culture. Even, even a patriarchal culture, maybe a benevolent patriarchy with, with Jerry as the jolly benevolent patriarch. Maybe we'll talk about that a little. Maybe we'll explore some of the the nuances of what it was like to be a, a young woman in this amazing, vital, alive, completely unique era. You traveled with the Grateful Dead. You went to Egypt. You took pictures. You were part of the whole scene. And I want to welcome you to our show. And I know that everybody who's watching right now is just about almost ex as excited as I am, but not quite, because I can't be <laughs> excited to have you here. So thank you so much for giving us a little slice of your time. I know you're heavily in demand and a lot is going on. So we're really grateful that you can be with us. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I met you at Jerry Day, what, five years ago or six I years ago? I think even six years ago or something. It something six years ago. It was after it was, oh, yeah, I it was felt into a dream around here. I don't even know what year it is anymore, but 
Yeah. yeah. It, yeah, it was the, you were getting I, ready to watch the wheel. You had just I watched I did, it. I think I did your radio show or something once. Right. So, so. it's the same radio station. Here we are. It's our 11th year in uh, broadcasting. And, and um, yeah, after I met you very, uh, it, if it was, it was August, it, ha, it was August. It was Jerry Day, right? Yeah. So right after that is, I think, is when I flew back to Israel and Mickey played on Mount Scopus. Oh, Mickey, far out. Mickey Hart band with um, Crystal Monet Hall as an amazing vocalist played in Jerusalem on Mount Scopus, and it was like the 23rd, I think, the 22nd or 23rd of August of 2013. And I remember was, you went there, yeah. Yeah, it was the highest yeah. of the high. So talk to us, tell us about the Grateful Dead Family Album. Remind us again when you first made the Grateful Dead Family Album. When was its first original uh, incarnation? Well, I first started working on it in 1985 because a lot of books started coming out about the Grateful Dead around that time. And I thought that they were all kind of lightweight or I don't know. I just, I just didn't think they were that great. And so, and I had a lot of pictures and of different, mostly of the 70s, because that's when I was heavily involved with them. And, um, and, uh, and I needed money. You know? <laughs> and so I, I needed money to pay for the storage bill on all my pictures. And so <laughs> I, went to the band, I went to the band and I said, you know, I got all these pictures and I was thinking maybe I could put a book together of my pictures. I, went, I actually went and asked the band at a board, I sent a proposal to a board meeting. And um, at the board meeting notes, Jerry's secretary, Sue, used to take the meeting notes and she was one of my best friends. And so she'd always give me the condensed version afterwards. And so she came back over to the office after the meeting and said, yeah, they said you could do it. And I said, really? I said, what did they say, what did they say though? She said, well, <laughs> they said, Gerilyn wants to do a book of her pictures. How much trouble can she get in? Really, really white of her to ask, before starting a project, nobody ever asked before starting a project before the board votes yes. So I thought, I, and I, the first band member I ran to into after I heard that from Sue was Phil. And I said, I know you guys think I'm dumb, but I'm not stupid. I live <laughs> with you guys. And I said, you know, it never occurred to me not to ask you guys. I live with you. Why would I not ask you? I want, I want you to be involved. And he said, oh, well, that makes sense. Okay, fine. And then when it came time for Warner Books started getting sticky about the whole thing because they were giving me a huge advance and they wanted some sort of assurance from the Grateful Dead that they weren't going to come back and bite them in the ass. Plus, you know, they'd been dealing with them for decades as a recording artist. So they had a reputation with Warners already. And so they wanted written assurance that this was going to be okay. And so they had a, they, I, I hated having to go back to the band a second time and ask for something, but I had to go back and ask them again for somebody in the band to sign off on this, that, that, that they approved of the content of the book. And so Phil Lesh became my hero at that point because he volunteered to do it, to oh, be the Phil. responsible guy and do the sign off. So he did that. And there was a letter that he had to sign at three different stages of production that said, I've seen the content of this book, and we've all seen it. You know, as a representative of the whole band, right? We've seen this, and this is okay. So he did so that. Phil kosher it. Did it. Phil kosher yeah. the book. <laughs> well, yeah, and then then they wanted the name Grateful Dead on the cover, and that was another ju giant hoop that I had to jump through because previous to that, we were calling it Deluxe Mix Nuts because I uh -huh. kind of thought that was a good description of the Grateful Dead scene as Deluxe Mix Nuts. Deluxe Mix Nuts. So, you know, so that was another hoop for Warners that we jumped through, but they got that too, and it, you know, it all worked. And um, so, yeah, it was in 1985 when all that went down, and the book got released finally in 1989, which was pretty timely because it was an anniversary year. And uh, the, the posters for Warners, it covers basically the first 25 years of the band's history. So the posters for Warners said, celebrate 25 years of life with the dead which was a great tagline for the book. That is so, very good. So the initial orders were so high because there, nothing had ever come from within the band before. Everybody wrote about them, but ne not, they never wrote about themselves and there was never anything. And from, there wasn't, 
There what there's not one story from a band member, I don't think, in the book. There's stories from Keeley. There's story there's stuff that the band members said because we heavily referenced. I mean, there's so much written about them that um, Alan Fist, who is really the editor and should have been named as a co-author, but he was too chicken to take the blame. Uh, <laughs> He made me take the blame all by myself. And, uh, but he's the one that wrote most of the book by going through all of the texts and carefully selecting pieces that were very descriptive of the band. Wow. I, I couldn't have had a better person than Alan to do that because he'd been with the band since the very beginning, even before the band, as a good longtime friend of Jerry's. And he went to Cambridge. So he was highly educated and very, very, you know, a, per a wonderful researcher. So, right. so he really knew what he was doing. Huh? Yeah, he really knew what he was. Yeah, doing. it's good to have somebody who knows what they're doing in charge, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was grateful that the band didn't need him at that time. At that, by at that particular time, because of Jerry's drug habits, mm. the band had blamed Rock and Alan for Jerry's drug problem, which was completely wrong. They had a drug problem because of Jerry not the other way around. They thought Jerry was contributing to, to they thought they were contributing to Jerry's drug problem when in fact, Jerry was to, contributing to Rock and Alan's drug problem. So yeah. the, band had, the band had fired both Rock and Alan at that point in an effort to get Jerry off drugs, which of course we all know didn't work at all. It completely backfired. And then the main thing that happened that when that went down was that Jerry got busted because he mm -hmm. had to start picking up his own drugs <laughs> instead of sending somebody to do it. And he couldn't make it all the way home without stopping in the park for a little cocktail on the way. So that's how he ended up getting busted. So that, that was the result of that brainchild of the, brand, the band. I, like, I, I, let's get rid of Rock and, Rock and Alan and then Jerry will for sure clean up. No. What's the dynamics though? Like, you know, this is the dynamics. Like who could possibly in their right mind take Jerry for a victim of other people's bad influence. Exactly. Like every time the every time the band I thought that was a good idea. Him, I mean, it, they they tried it several times to do an intervention on him too, and that was another nightmare that the poor guy had to endure. You know, it's just the band was pretty clueless. It was sad. They just didn't know what to do. Right. You know, they, you know, Jerry Jerry was the leader of the band because he was the only one that could make decisions, basically. So that was, just, that was not good. But so anyway, um, it worked out great for me because Rock, Rock was a great fundraiser and he went out and raised a ton of money before Warners gave me my huge advance. Rock helped fund the whole project by, he even got his favorite bartender to put 400 bucks in. And he was the first guy that I paid back when I got the advance. Rock went out and raised, I think about like 40 or $50,000 or something wow. in chunks. And that was $1989, people. Uh, 1986 dollars. 1985 dollars. Yeah, it took right. five years. It took almost five years to put that book together. It started so in 85. Do, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, and show yeah let's do that. A few things from the book? Yeah, I want to show people. Okay. This, web, this website was created to... Um, oops, okay, let's go. Oh, oh shit, there, I got to click on the wrong thing. There we go. This book was created to um, to fund this book. This book was created to this website was created for this book. So the book is on the wheel. The wheel here's here's see so here's the wheel. Here's the on top of the screen. Here you can see what the this is a screenshot of a page from the wheel. Right. It's like a regular website page with I mean a regular social network type page, and uh you know it's got like groups and profiles and members and all that uh -huh. stuff. And then, but the main thing is it's got the family album book in its entirety. This is the page, this first page shows you the title pages from the first eight chapters. So, so anybody that wants to buy my book, you can also buy my book at the wheel. You yes. Can, there's a, you, you can, it's right at the top of the family album book, uh, what do they call these things, a tab or whatever. It says buy this book, so you can buy it on the wheel. That's mostly why we created yeah. this book, that is a, this is so, and you can take a look at the book before you buy it, you know, and every one of you click on each one of these and it'll open up the chapter that it goes to and you go from page to page to page. And this goes up to chapter eight. I think there's 13 chapters in the book altogether. And uh, that's Egypt, which was 
Egypt was a really big deal for us. Yeah, it, we want to talk about Egypt. We want to yeah, hear a little it, bit about uh, what it was like to be on the bus and and go to uh, uh, so okay. close to the promised land. Yeah, so it's here. Old here. country, Egypt, you know. Yeah, this <laughs> is the first page of the Egypt chapter. And here's the story. It says, once upon a time, there was a rock and roll band. Can you read this on your screen? Yeah, it's a little small, but it. Uh, it well, I can read it out loud. It's pretty quick. This is my, my story. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a rock and roll band who wanted to play at the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The boys asked their Uncle Bill and even came to his house late one night with placards and a chant. He was intrigued, but like any good uncle, he advised caution. Of course, the boys and girls, being artists, threw caution to the wind, damned the torpedoes, and proceeded on their own. A logistical exercise was mounted to bring sound lights and staging over land and sea from Egypt and band equipment from California. Meanwhile, deadheads from all over America and Europe made their group travel arrangements. They made up about half of the audience, the other half being Cairo citizens and Bedouin who wandered in from the desert. Proceeds from the sale of tickets were donated to the Department of Antiquities and Madame Sadat's Faith and Hope Charity for Handicapped Children. The occasion was auspicious. The Camp David peace talks were in progress, and the third night witnessed the total eclipse of the moon, though these things were unknown at the time of the concert dates were set. But such chance is to be expected, it was said. Being in Egypt as, Egypt as special guest was more the most wonderful experience I could imagine at that time. The world was in turmoil. The men at the respective helms were basically interested in peace. We were fortunate to be the cultural ambassadors. One-on-one, -on -one, the hippies and the local people of Giza, where the Great Pyramid is set, understood each other at a basic level. This was true at all other places we visited, Cairo, Luxor, Aswan, and points beyond. Whether floating down the Nile on a boat to the Valley of the Kings or visiting in the homes of the villagers, I felt the optimism that comes from the exchange of culture between peoples of open mind. Gerald. So that was my little capsulized version of our trip to Egypt. And this page, that's the story. So the, the story's right there. And that's a picture of Mickey and Bill and Phil. I made those signs. And that's a, the bottom picture is a- Egypt or bust. Huh? It says yeah. Egypt or bust. Yeah, they said, yeah, they said Egypt. Mickey talked about this when he was on the thing the other day for Rex Foundation. They said, the sign said Egypt or bust, new PA a must. And he didn't remember the whole thing because on the other <laughs> side it said, on the other side of the signs, it says, more trips, better gigs. So uh, <laughs> that, was, that was our plan. The plan was, Egypt or bus, new PA a must. More trips, better gigs. You know, Egypt or bus, new PA a must. More trips, better gigs. And Mickey and Phil paraded around in Bill's driveway at his house, chanting that with tambourines and stuff like that. That's hysterical. Like, like hard fishes. And Bill comes to the door and he goes, what the fuck do you grateful dead people want now? <laughs> oh my and God. And then he led us in the house and we sat down and talked to him and said, you know, we want to go to Egypt. He was like, are you guys crazy? Egypt, forget it. There's a war going on, you know? Ridiculous. I, no way, you know? And he absolutely, totally refused to cover out of our minds. And as soon as we left, he called up Rock Scully and said, you're fucking band members are here and they think that you're going to Egypt and there's no way I'm going to take you to blah, blah, blah. And he just went nuts on everybody. And he absolutely, right till the last minute when he saw that we'd actually figured out how to do it, he decided to go. At the last he minute, he, he said, you know, said, of course, you'll be our guest. Of course, come along. It'll be fun. And so he came as our guest. And he brought some of his lieutenants from Bill Graham Presents and, and a girlfriend, uh, Regina. And, uh, you know, and he came to Egypt and he was our buddy there. I bet he loved it. I, you know, he's my personal hero in terms of being a, a, a entrepreneur and raconteur is Bill Graham. He's, there was nobody like him. So this was September of, of 80, 86. That, when was Egypt? No, but September 78. I'm sorry, 78. Yeah. Why did I say 86? So 78. And it was a full moon and it was a lunar eclipse, right? Yeah, on the third night. And it was the three nights of the Camp David talk. So Anwar Sadat wasn't there, but like, right. you know, we, we, Joe Malone was the guy that was with the State Department and he 
set everything up for us and, and helped us get the B plus rating that got them into Egypt before Frank Sinatra. I was, I was so grateful Dad made it to Egypt before Frank Sinatra did. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, there, that's the source of that story is a huge source of rumors. From living in Israel and the entire Jewish Israeli deadhead community that lives in Israel, there's a whole uh, apocryphal story about how Jerry Garcia went to Jerusalem for like a day trip while he was in Egypt. I know somebody who claims, swears on a staff of Torah's Lahavdil that he actually saw him in the old city. Uh, a very famous rabbi whose name I won't mention right now because he might be upset. But anyway, he should live and be well. So that'd, be pretty, that'd be pretty easy to, it'd be pretty easy to actually confirm by asking Mountain Girl. But even so, I seriously doubt that happened because, um, for one, Jerry wasn't that adventurous, you know, <laughs> you know, and he kind of stuck with the plan. And like we all said, we were all, we all stuck pretty close to each other. And Jerry, especially Jerry was pretty, like not exactly supervised, but there was people like his manager was with him and Mountain Girl was with him. And he, for him to go off and take a day trip like that would have been a logistical experience. Yeah, it's an apocryphal story. I don't necessarily believe it, but we like to think it's true. Like many sure, of our, you know? well, like many of our religious legends. I tell, hey, I tell people he's not even dead. He went to Puerto Rico. You know? <laughs> Because they wouldn't let him take a break from the band, you know. And right. Got a way to get a break by just, you know. By he, just dying. He, but like every time they t gave him a break, he would go do his side gigs and Jerry Garcia band. So even that. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was pointless to try to. It was the same with Mickey. I mean, neither he or Mickey were the type of guys that you could get on vacation. One time, one time we had to do uh, our Christmas celebration at, at the rehearsal hall on Front Street because. We knew that if we tried to throw a Christmas party anywhere else, that we, there was no chance we could get Jerry to come. So we decided to have the Grateful Dead Family Christian, because we used to have it at the log cabin and see, you know, other places, because none of our houses were big enough. But so we finally decided this one year to have it at Front Street. And, you know, and so that's what we did. And Jerry wasn't happy about it, because that was his recording studio. Right. <laughs> so we all were. And so we finally talked him into being Santa Claus and got him into a Santa Claus suit. And, you know, he went along with it eventually, but we had to ambush him. You know, it wasn't easy to get him to do fun stuff. When did you first, when did you first meet Jerry? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, probably. Well, I, when I got to really actually meet him close up and talk to him, was when I worked for Chet at the Family Dog on the Great Highway. So that would have been 1969. No, actually, I met him before that. I met him in 1968. When I met him actually as a person, I met him in August 2nd, 1968 at the Hippodrome Ballroom in San Diego because the Grateful Dead came down to play for us there. We had our own ballroom in San Diego, me and my friend. Wow. I'd, come up, I'd seen him in San Francisco a bunch of times at the Avalon and at, film, at the Fillmore. And I saw him at the Trips Festival, but I didn't know him at all. They, they lived near where we lived in the Haight-Ashbury. They lived a few blocks away, but I didn't, I think they had already maybe moved. They, they still live there, but I didn't, I just didn't know them. You know, our, we weren't, right. I, wasn't, I wasn't in the music business then. I was just a fan so right. I was just being from the audience. But I met him when they came down to play for us in August of 1968. And the band stayed out at a hotel that a friend of mine's family um family owned and so i got to know all of them pretty well on that weekend and rock scully invited me i told him i was going to be going back to san francisco as soon as our run was done with that ballroom because i had come up here in 1965 and 66 and went back to san diego for christmas of 66 67 and christmas and new year's and i was gotten pregnant and i was so i didn't want to go back up to san francisco until after my baby was born he was born in august of 67. Mm -hmm. so the grateful dead played for us there in uh, in august of 68 my son was a year old when the grateful dead played for us down there and then they came back again in september and played a big festival and rock scully told me the first time i met him in august he said well when you come back up to the bay area look me up and i'll help you get a job because he knew I knew how to run a knew how to run a ballroom and do shows uh -huh. and stuff. So when I came back to San Francisco in 1968, 
um, uh, in, in like early 1969, I think, when we came back. Um, I went to see Rock, and he hooked me up with Chet Helms. It was like, I don't know, I don't even think we were in town for more than a few days when he hooked us up with Chet Helms. And both my husband and I got a job working with Chet out at Grateful Dead, and I mean, a family dog on the Great Highway. And the Grateful Dead played for us a whole lot out there. I got to know all the roadies really, really well, and the band members really well, because they, they played for us probably more than probably more than any other band they played for us. Right. So, so the that's trouble, a really trouble, all, the trouble, all the trouble with Lenny Hart started because Lenny Hart decided that the family dog would be a good place for the Grateful Dead to call home, and he ah. he came and made a proposal to Chet and and to me because I was in the room too, to have the family to have the Grateful Dead partner up with Chet and partner up with the family dog, and the Grateful Dead would use the Great Highway location for their main rehearsal hall. And they'd be the house band and all this other kind of stuff. And after that meeting, Chet tried calling Rock at the office and was told that he was on the road. And so he tracked him down the road. It was John McIntyre and Chet. I mean, John McIntyre and uh, Rock at that time. It might have been Danny still. But, but at any rate, he told them about this meeting he just had with Lenny Hart. And they went, oh, really? They hadn't heard anything about it. Nobody in the band had been consulted at all. So that, that sort of was the beginning of the end of Lenny Hart because of that proposal he made to the family dog, which I think Dennis wrote about it in his book. I'm not entirely sure, but I know that's what, I know that's what happened because I was there. So, you know, it wasn't a big surprise to me when the guy got sent packing, you know, but it broke Mickey's heart. I didn't really know Mickey that well because I thought he was very strange. So I, I knew Jerry really well, and I knew Bobby really well, and I knew all the roadies really well, but I didn't know Mickey. I didn't get to know Mickey until um, 1971. After the Family Dogs had closed, I went to work for Warner Brothers Records. And I had a project at Warner Brothers that involved Mickey Hart because he had been signed by the company. Him, Bobby, and Jerry were all signed by Warners in 1971 to do solo albums because oh. they were make it. They're, Warners was trying to keep the Grateful Dead under contract by signing the solo members and giving them a lots of money. Now, who was it, who was behind the brains behind that whole thing at Warner? Joe Smith. Okay. A guy named Joe Smith. So he and thought by by giving solo deals to everyone, he would keep them all in the stable in the Warner stable, so to speak. What? He thought so, by giving solo deals to them, he'd keep them and the band all in the Warner stable. He was hoping that that would convince them to stay by, you know, supporting with Jerry, Jerry, Bobby, and Mickey all got solo contracts with Warners, and that's where their first solo albums came from. Rolling Thunder, Ace, I think, I haven't helped the fools with Arista, I think, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, and they all got paid, I think. I know Mickey got $100,000. It was a three album deal for $100,000 an album. And I think, I think the other ones were probably fairly similar. That was a lot of money. And Mickey, Mickey built a recording studio with the money. He did, you know, we had a chance to buy this big ranch, but we found out that it was already going to have been incorporated into the city plan to be turned into something else down the road. Mm. So we decided not, not to own the property, but to build a studio. So we did that and the studio, served Mickey really well. He did a lot of work there and so did a lot of other people. It was a wonderful, wonderful asset to the Grateful Dead, that studio. Yeah. So anyway, what else? Well, okay, let's just take a breath for a minute. I have to digest this. This is all very intense. That's a, a lot of history under your belt, your proverbial belt here. So I know people I want to ask that. what it's like to be a woman in the Grateful Dead male dominated world. Well a friend of ours, who had a, had a deadhead friend of ours who had a printing company, um, it was called Ragged Edge Press, and he made these really cool postcards and whatnot. And at one run of postcards, he made these ones that said, do you want to talk to the man in charge or the woman who knows what's going on? And <laughs> I loved that one so much that I brought it home from one of my trips to New York, and I put it up on the wall of cubbies that were everybody's mailboxes. I put it up on the wall right by the mailboxes and it never came down. Everybody loved it because it was the perfect description of the Grateful Dead scene. Do you want to talk to the man who in charge or the woman who knows what's going on? 
The other guys might have been in charge, but they didn't know what was going on. They never, they didn't want to know what was going on. They knew that we had it covered. They had a lot of wonderful, smart, strong women around them that took care of everything that needed to be taken care of, whether it was bookkeeping or promotion or. She's whatever. got everything delightful. She's got everything I need. Takes the wheel when I'm seen double, pays my ticket when go. I speed. Waits right. backstage while I sing to you. There's yeah. these archetypes of women as like super powerful and capable, but also like in, in like a muse in that they're all the energy that is happening is directed towards the the artist, so to speak, you know, well, not even so to speak, the actual real artist and their ability to do their art. And so the artist doing their art is here and then the women making everything happen, the entire infrastructure, the uh, and and the motor of the whole thing. You well, know? Pretty, pretty traditional <laughs> setup. <laughs> traditional family, you know, the men family, and the, family the men dynamic. And they did. They killed dino. You know, they killed dinosaurs or whatever. You know, and we just made <laughs> sure that there was something for them to come home to. You know, and also, I mean, most of us were capable of running a business. And right, and you have people like Betty, awesome. like huh? record the recording engineer Betty. The the yeah. you had you had pioneering women, women who were stepping out and doing things. How many other women were in the record industry when you were in the record industry when you were working for Warner's? You know, there's that's not a, also a really male dominated not industry. Many. Not not very many, and it's you know it's not it's not so much that way anymore, of course, but. Back then, there wasn't very many, you know, and most of us uh, um, functioned in support roles, you know, and that, right. that, that kind of remains to be true right along. Very few of us were executives, you know. I mean, I was, I was the vice president and secretary of our corporation, but, you know, that's just because I did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, all, all the, all the corporate work. I did the bookkeeping. I did the bookkeeping. I did the payroll. I did all that kind of stuff. And Mickey made the money, you know. There you he go. Made, he made the money, and I distributed it. Well, when Rick, when when Mickey came to Israel, we got to um, uh, the Radio Free Nachlao, which is myself and my radio partner Steve Levine, and some of our good friends who we had in tow with us got to go backstage and interview him and talk to him, and we asked him about his bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> his Hebrew name and like you know we're look, we're looking at like the Jewish roots of Mickey Hart right uh, and they're, we they're pretty they're pretty pretty minimal they're they're not gigantic but they're there they're they're they're, they're legitimate credentials but they're yeah, not yeah. like he wasn't raised in a in a Hasidic neighborhood and he didn't grow up wearing payas and and going to religious school but you know there there he the, this is a this is a radio station that. Our main broadcast is from Jerusalem. We started in Israel, and we're like ground zero for the the Israeli Jewish deadhead community, which is the most hardcore, hardcore Jewish deadhead community in the world. They're they're the most intense. You so, know what? One, one time, one of my Jewish deadhead friends from the East Coast asked me, "Why do the Grateful Dead always play on the high Jewish holidays? What's up with that?" And so I said, I don't know, I'll find out. And so the next guy I ran into, of course, was again was Phil. And I said, Hey Phil, these deadheads are asking me like what why you guys always play at Madison Square Garden on the high holidays? And he goes, What? He goes, That has nothing to do with the Jewish people. He goes, It's the basketball schedule. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, they thought the guy had something against the Jews. <laughs> no, no, everybody not. knows that's not true. Phil does a Seder every year now at um, Terrapin Crossroads, which is so much Yeah, fun. I know. The Jewish deadheads over there ran, won him over. That's you know? right. He's, but, he's, no, he's one he, of us he, now. He was, he was shocked that the, the, the Jewish deadheads would think that the Grateful Dead did something like that intentionally. Yeah, no, nobody really what? would ever think that. Nobody, nobody oh. would really think that ever because there's such a disproportionate amount, amount of Jewish deadheads in the, in the Jewish, I mean, in the, in the deadhead white community. So well, I, um, I think I told this deadhead, I said, like, I can't imagine that they're discriminating against you guys. I'm sure it's a coincidence, you know, no. some sort. Someone wasn't watching the the Jewish calendar at the same time that they were watching the, the NBA calendar and the other 
bookings that go on in a place like Madison. No, Square it's like that. The band members don't have any idea how they're booking <laughs> them. That's the last right. thing on their mind. Because that's right. when all they turned over to booking agents from the beginning. Right. So I don't think anyone in the Grateful Dead ever booked a gig. Rock did that. that oh, yeah. I'm right sure. The beginning, there was Rock and Danny. You know, so... So they when did so here are, here's a, a delicate question. So we were talking before, and since it's oh well, we missed 4:20. It's 4:34 now. But since we we're talking before a little bit about Jerry Garcia's, um, you know, I mean, what we're talking about with Jerry is beyond the you know. Be, I I I have a personal objection to um, to white powdery manufactured substances. I feel like they're very negative, whereas I feel the, the uh, things that come from nature, like you know, flowers and, and such, are, are, have a more positive and useful functionality. But I, I, I was very, very mad when Jerry died. Like I was really angry at him for dying in that specific way and for being like a junkie and having of course just like elvis just like michael jackson just like prince probably everyone who's like a leader and big and that everybody else is getting their money from in some way like the train is rolling and it's not going to keep rolling without this person so there's a certain amount of enabling and turning your a blind eye and to, to see what's going on because your paycheck is attached to that that guy you know yeah. and, and so like there's this I was mad, like I was really mad when he died. Um, I took it very personally because my late ex-husband died in, in, uh, in, he died late, he became, he became a heroin addict um, in 1991. And uh, it was a really horrible scene and, and we got a divorce and he ended up dying of AIDS. And it was a, like a really horrible thing. So I had it all in my mind with, with heroin and husbands and desertion and leaving and dying and everything was all mixed up. It took me several years after Jerry died to be able to listen to him again. Like I couldn't, I, I, was, I had a feeling of anger. So I got over it, I'm fine with him now, I love him. I have a completely different perspective. I still hate heroin, but I guess my question is, at what point since you were there from the very beginning, it sounds like Jerry, you know, Jerry always, Jerry always was, ex was Jerry. He was always charismatic. He also always had this natural leadership ability, even though he would always say, oh, this band has no leaders. There's no leader of the band, but he was the leader of the band. So, but when did it come, go from everyone just loving him and being friends and it being sort of like a, a scene to, you can't, you can't touch this guy. You can't really talk to him. You can't really sit him down and say, fuck. This is fucking horrible. You know, you got to stop. Like, when did that transition happen where he, he couldn't really be approached because he was too big, I guess you could say. I don't know. Well, that, at, that, at that point, I, was, I wasn't working for the band anymore. And I wasn't that, I didn't hang around with them that much. It was disappointing for everybody. Right. Nobody, liked, well, nobody, nobody liked witnessing that. It broke... It broke everybody's heart because it, I, I, heroin's a very isolating drug. Very. So it just, first it takes the people away from you a little bit at a time. You don't notice it so much right away, but after a while you realize that, you know, that they're not available like they used to. Jerry used to be really available. He would, he would go to the gigs early and if anybody wanted to see him, they could say, is, is Jerry in the back? And they'd go, yeah, he's back there. You could go see him. He was available. He was accessible. He became right. not accessible, um, even for people like me that were um, close friends to him and were invited to his house. Sometimes I would have to, you know, I'd go there and knock on the door and he wouldn't answer. And I'd have to go back down the hill to the payphone to call his secretary at the office to ask her if he was home. And she'd say, yeah, let me call him, let me, let me call him and tell him you're, you're at the door, you know? And so right. she would call him and tell him. Gerald, that's Gerald that's knocking, you know. So, you know, so he wasn't, he was pretty, you know, he didn't see people. He always would see Betty. He loved Betty and always would see her. She cut his hair, so he definitely would see her. But, you know, they just become, their friendships become limited. I would see him, he would be at Rock's house a lot. I'd see him at Rock's, but 
he became less available. Mm -hmm. And then he became sick. He got really sick after that first round with, with drugs. And, you know, because he said, you don't eat. And, you know, he wasn't eating and he wasn't, I don't know if he was sleeping. I imagine he was a little bit, but he was at least nodded out, you know. We would worry constantly that he was going to set himself on fire because, you know, he was smoked all the time and there was burn holes and everything in his house. Betty told me one day she went to see him and there was burn holes everywhere on the carpet. The whole carpet had burn holes all over it. And um, even in hotel rooms on the road, you would do that too. So, you know, mm. she, we used to make jokes about the inflatable room and stuff and, and, you know, like put him somewhere where there'd be fire extinguishers handy or whatever. But I mean, it was heartbreaking for everybody. But when he died, that was actually kind of a surprise because he was somewhat healthy. I saw him two days before. I saw him two days before he came by the office to have a meeting with Sue. And I was taking care of Sonny Barger's dog. And I had him locked up in the garbage area down below the office stairs. And Jerry pulled in the parking lot and said, where'd you get the dog? You know, and I told him it was Sonny's. And he said, oh, how's Ralph doing? And blah, blah. And then I told him that I was, his wife, Sonny's wife was going to come pick up the dog in a little while. And could he, she come see him? And he said, sure. And so I sent Sharon over to see Jerry and they had a nice visit across the street. And then she came and got the dog and left. And then that was like, and it was two days later in the very early morning, not two days, it was not the next day, but the day after, early in the morning, I got a call from a guy that was supposed to be helping me with the job, crying, another close friend of the, the, Jerry's and said, Jerry's dead. And I said, how do you know that? That's ridiculous. Let me call Sue. And I called his secretary and she said, you know, I just got a call. And McNally, let me call you back. Oh my God. Like seven in the morning or something. So, and I was like, what? And she, and I said, what? Because I mean, we had both just seen him and he was, seemed fine, you know, but his heart was damaged. All the crap that he had done did its work. You know, his heart was really damaged. And also, yeah. when was, I heard all these rumors going around too that some deadhead had scored him a bunch of dope and that. They brought it to him out at the rehab center and you know like which is even worse news you know if that was true i don't think so i think i think i the autopsy doesn't show stuff like that it just shows congestive heart failure which you know he was not a, he wasn't a super healthy guy he wasn't like a runner or anything no you know? no he wasn't a <laughs> runner you know, I mean, it wasn't a huge surprise that his heart wasn't strong he didn't really do a whole lot you know i mean scuba diving he loved that and if he could have scuba dived every day, he probably would have been healthier, you know? Because you, of, of, uh, you always think of the guitar and vocals as like a cardio exercise in some no. way. <laughs> not yeah. so, it ends up that it's not actually the same thing as running or, or actual cardio then, huh? Yeah, and breaking a, breaking a sweat on a hot stage is not the same as running, you know? It's a different kind of sweating. I guess so. Uh-oh, well, I guess I'm in trouble. So we'll see about that, God forbid. But, uh, oh, you wow. drove for? I'm no, always I'm kidding. I'm kidding because I don't run. Oh, yeah, I can't. I can't. I can barely walk at this point in my life. I have a lot of trouble walking. So. But I had polio when I was a kid. So ah. nothing, nothing about my dis disability surprises me. And then I had a stroke two years ago. Mm. So that sort of, I'm kind of, I'm half, I'm, this is as far as I can make my right, my left arm. It just, it'll go up a little higher, but that's about it. Because it's paralyzed. Wow. My left, my left leg's paralyzed pretty much, so I drag it oh. around. Well, Rafua Shalema, we wish you the, 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 the speediest and the bestest recovery. And it looks like you have some oh, good okay. help there. Your friend is comes and helps you out and and you're being well taken care of in your oh, and she's an adorable girl she just got a scholarship to study at the academy of, of uh, art for four years on a full ride she's wow a very, ta very talented uh, designer clothing mazel tov yeah she's, mazel adorable. Tov. she's a wonderful deadhead girl that i adore and uh very spiritual and sweet and loving and smart and uh really good girl yeah that's I'm blessed. amazing I'm so blessed so so, so um i want to tell people that they can go to your this website called the gdwheel.com right which is where you can find information about the family album book and so the family the grateful dead family album has been re-released as a digital album is that right yeah well i put it i put it, I put it online as an independent website for a 
a couple of years called the Grateful Dead Family And then, and then as technology, I got the thing is my book was out of print for 25 years. There's lots of deadheads that never saw it because it was out of print from 1995 until uh, 2019. It was out of print because the publishing companies got merged and the company that bought my book rights from Warner's. Lot, somehow somebody lost my color separations. Oh so no! They, nobody could print my book, and oh. and the company that they sold my book to decided they didn't want another rock and roll book, and so they gave me the rights back. Oh. So I had this wonderful gift in that I owned the rights to this best-selling book. I sold over two hundred and fifty thousand copies of that book. I wow. sold so many. I sold so many book copies in pre-order that I recouped a quarter of a million dollar advance on the first printing of the book, because, you know, and I met everybody's That's publishing family. history, young lady. Yeah, no, I, I, I met everybody's family members in 1989-90, because they all bought it for Christmas. Thank you, people, thank <laughs> you. And so I got to meet everybody's family, and that was very cool. And they sold a lot of books, but now with COVID, I can't sell any books. And for 20 years, I sort of had books to sell because I kept buying what Warner's found in their warehouses. As Warner Books uh, cleaned out their warehouses, I was allowed to buy the books at this heavy discount. Oh, the wow. Last batch, the last batch that they found, there were, it was in paperback only from 1980, 1991. It got printed in paperback, and so it was only paperback after that. So the hardcovers were only the first, there were two printings in hardcover. So that was about 100,000 books. And then everything since then has been paperback. So anyway, the last warehouse they cleared out was 1,700 copies, and I got to buy them for a dollar a piece, including shipping. That's it incredible. Gift. It was a huge gift. And so, but then I finally ran out of books, and I got to the point where I had no books, and so I wanted to, I wanted to put it online because the online thing seems to be happening, and technology was getting better. And finally, in 19, whenever that was, in 2000 something, whatever the scanning technology got good enough that I could tear apart a book, scan the pages, and put them online. Right. So it wasn't good enough to reprint the book from then, but so that's what I did. And I had GratefulDeadFamily.com for a couple of years, which is an interactive version of the book, which it now it lives on the wheel. I still have that, but it lives on the wheel now because we decided to use that book. So it got some track. We got some tracks, and not a lot, but we decided to uh, marry it to a social network. Okay. So it would be a special social network just for deadheads that would use the family album as the middle, as the hub. Right. And I decided to call it the wheel because I figured the deadheads could relate to that. And so the idea was that the family album is in the middle as the hub, and then spokes are attached to it, which are things that represent the Grateful Dead scene. Uh, vendors, um, uh, Nonprofits, Radio Knocklot, you know, right. the, spoke, the different theaters are spokes. Everything that connects to us, that's a spoke on our wheel. And the wheel is what makes Deadhead Life go around. Right. So that was the idea behind the wheel. And I'm, I had a stroke two years ago, so it's not like I've been doing a whole lot on it for the last couple of years. It was like, it all happened at the same time. I got the book reprinted, I got the network launched, and I had a stroke. So... Slowly but slowly, I, 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 I got, got 5,000 books printed. I now have 5,000 fresh off the presses, beautifully printed books to sell. And, and people I, can get I, them I, through I, this hub, right? They can I get was, it. I, I was going out and doing festivals and stuff. I did Skull and Roses and I did a few festivals before the COVID thing happened. Right. I want to show people, I have, I'm sharing my screen right now. So this is the, yeah, the hub. Yeah. The hub, it's the GD, as in Grateful Dead, wheel.com. That's the website. And this is sort of the front, front of the website. We have a little, a little pig pen face there. Um, and the register, pen. sign up. But up here it says family album book, right? So you can. Yeah, yeah, buy hardcover, right. Where it says buy hardcover, it'll take you here. And it's just so easy. You can. Uh, Choose this one or the one that's signed by Gerilyn. Yeah, that's personalized by me. I keep I keep a little stash here at the house. So when Dante, my my partner Dante, uh -huh. that part of it, and when he gets an order, he 
emails it to me and then I sign the book and I give my carrier to trot it up to the mailbox and right so that's you know whatever you want me to put on it if you ordered the that more expensive version I'll personalize it for it and however you want right and like Geraldine said before you can go to all of the different chapters check out what's in the chapter like you click on the chapter and a little yeah. preview comes up tells you, you what's can, in you have it. It's interactive. You can comment on the, you can comment on the pages too. It's a great site. It really has so much information, and you know you can sign up uh, and be a spoke. I think Radio Free Knockle Oat might be somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Yes, we are. We're a spoke on the wheel. I remember signing. Oh, great. Up. Yeah, when I you are you are on the wheel already, right? Yeah, we're on the wheel. Like I said, I had a stroke a couple of years ago. I haven't been paying a lot of attention. I was doing pretty good there for a while, but the thing about it is once it's created, it's like if you build it, they will come. That's right. So now it's the wheel. Just has to go. The, the, it, it, people used to make jokes about how long it took the Grateful Dead to do things. You know, like it'd take us years and years to put on an album or it take just the people in general. Like I, I, I made a shirt one time for Paul Cantor from the Jefferson Airplane and I worked on it for years and because I decided to embroider it and I'm slow with that. And his girlfriend said to me, only a person in the grave. And then I lost it. I moved or something. I'm thinking I broke up. I'm thinking I broke up. I moved, you know, blah, blah. And so I went back to about 20 years later. I go and I show it to Cynthia. And I go, here's the shirt I was working on for a She goes, only somebody in the Grateful Dead could work on something for 20 years. Like, well, hey, so what? You know, it's like, why not? Why not? Why so not? We got staying power. I'll say that about the Grateful Dead scene. We have to be a special kind of person to join our movie. You know? It's so true. I, that's well, Steve and I have been doing Radio Free Knockload for 11 years now, and it's just the uh -huh. two of us throwing the internet screen back and forth between each other for 11 years. Between, you know, every day, uh, six days a week, except for Shabbat, we're, we're playing music for an international audience, and only people who are deadheads are crazy enough to do that. So. Remember what Jerry said about licorice? What? People that like licorice really like it, and people that don't, don't. It tastes for some that you have to acquire, and others are just born to it. Some people, the first time they hear the Grateful Dead, that's it for them. I mean, I hear that from more deadheads than not. Most of them, it was one of those things where they like, and me, even including me, not me so much, just in the sense that. The Grateful Dead were never my favorite band. The Sons of Champlin and the Quicksilver. The Quicksilver first and then the Sons of Champlin. Hmm. I came to the Grateful Dead because those two bands stopped playing. And once I got into the Grateful Dead, I really liked their music. And the thing is, they're funny, intelligent people. It was the people more than the music that brought me close to the Grateful Dead because hmm. they were very interesting people. And most of them are been my friends for the last 50 years. My closest friends are the people in the Grateful Dead scene because but I spent a lot of time with them in the 70s and it just sort of stuck, you know? Right. And, and who do you hang out with now? Do you see Mar Mountain Girl Carolyn at all? Well, she lives in Oregon, so I don't see her very much, but I call her once in a while. I see Betty whenever I can. And Betty's the person that if I can't speak for myself, Betty's going to speak for me. My kids kind of flipped out about that, but I told them, you know what? I need an adult that will answer the phone, you know. And they're both adults, but they don't like answering their phone very much. So, you know, but Betty, I mean, I trust her with my life, literally. So, you know, and other people, the person whose house I'm living in is a big fan of the Grateful Dead. And that's how I met him through Barlow, actually. You know, Barlow asked me to take care of him when he was sick. And back in 2015, he asked me to help him out. And I stuck with him until he died. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm living in the house right now where John was when he died. He lived in this house a few times. And the man who owns this house is a big fan and a wonderful human being. So I feel, you know, I'm, I think I chose the right family to move in with, you know. I think you did. Ago. I think you did. It's worked for me so far. And that's, that's, I think, what made my book work is because I went around to all those people that I love so much. And I asked them each to give me their favorite picture or a picture they liked so that everybody would be happy about it. I mean, less complaining that way. And so, and then I got stories. Rosie gave me stories. Rosie was a 
wonderful, wonderful. Person. She's a, great. She's great. And Herbie Green and other people that, because of their love for the Grateful Dead, they let me access all their archives and stuff like that. And people in the family that gave me their family pictures, the baby pictures and stuff. People want to know where I got their baby pictures from. I'm like, their mothers. <laughs> Just go straight to the source. That's Except right. a, couple, a couple cases I, you know, I had to go to other extremes, but those are stories to be told another day. But yeah. uh, you know. we're, we're just so grateful that you could give us some, t some of your time. I know that, you know, you, you got a lot of stuff going on. It's really, you're so special that we got to hear all these stories from you. Oh, sure. Well, you know, I've been watching, I watched Mickey's interview and I watched Rosie's thing that she did with Jay for a couple hours. And before I, just before I had the stroke, I was working on a slideshow presentation with the intention of going on the road with it mm -hmm. and doing college Zoom. So I've done a, co a college Zoom class already recently, you know, where I talk about the book and stuff, but there's not that many colleges that teach classes on the Grateful Dead. But though they're, 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 a lot of them would take a person like me to come and talk as a just, you know, because of the cultural significance. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think I'll probably get back to doing something like that. I've also thought about starting a YouTube channel but that seems like a lot of responsibility. I watch a lot of YouTube channels. I, you could I make a podcast. TV. You could make a podcast. Yeah, you I know? could do that. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of things you could do. As I as I get a little bit more recovered, right? I can do things like this, and this will help me get started with that kind of thing. Well, we we wish you a hundred percent, a hundred percent recovery very quickly, and we'll we keep you in our well, prayers. It's been a whole two years so far, but I'm getting there little by little. It takes I a little. I read a history of a woman that it took eight years to recover. So I thought, all right, I don't want it to take eight years, but and I don't, you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not concerned about doing what I used to be able to do. If I can just do most things okay, then I'm fine, you know. But thank you for all the good wishes. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Sherilyn. And thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for watching this special interview with Sherilyn Brandelis, the author of The Grateful Dead Family Album. You can find out how to get your hands on that for your very own at thegdwheel.com. GD like Grateful Dead. Thegdwheel.com. And just click on the Family Album book and you'll be taken to those links and again, we just want to thank you so much for being our guest today at Radio Free Nakla Oats, 11th annual Nine Days of Jerry, celebrating the life, the music, the legacy, the love, the legend, everything that we love so much about Jerry Garcia. And thanks for sharing your wonderful memories with us. Well, thank you. Very much. I'm oh. hoping that, I'm hoping that, well, I'm pretty sure that by next year this time, I ought to be able to get out there and be among you again. I, I kept my reservation in for the Skull and Roses Festival because I really like the promoter and I have every intention of that happening again this next year. Amen, so, amen. Let us, let us all pray we can all be together again uh, forever and ever as we make it to the promised land. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.